So um, today's package notes is the biggest packet of the semester. And um, some of the slides are meant to be background. And for many of you who are in the earth sciences department, um, it will be review. Um, but I like to cover climate change by looking at the paleo and the modern and the future. And if any of what I talked about and go through relatively quickly today is not new for you, then you are very welcome to ask questions at the end or at your leisure. So um, we're going to try to cover basic controls of global climate and what we know from paleo records primarily and the role of the carbon cycle in that. And then we'll switch to talk about anthropogenic forcing greenhouse gases climate conditions on the planet, models, and what they tell us about the future, et cetera. So that's kind of the roadmap for today. So we've talked about this before, but I just want to remind you that a surplus of radiation received from the sun at the poles, and there's, I mean, excuse me, at the equator and at the poles there's a deficit. There's amounts of heat transfer that occurs in both the atmosphere and the oceans that leads to this kind of uh, pattern of the equator receiving more sun than the poles and being more heat in the poles. This is why we have ice caps at the poles and why it's warm at the equator. And this is just a map kind of showing you this in more detailed view. This is the amount of heat received and absorbed by the planet. So obviously there's a certain amount of reflection. It has to do with what the surface of the earth is, as well as the angle of the earth, deeper parts. Um, reflect differently than flat parts, etc. But you can see that this is in watts per meter squared, which is a common unit that's used for this kind of work that the equatorial regions receive a lot and the polar regions receive a little. And as you can imagine, since this is largely driven by how the Earth <clears throat> rotates around the sun, this hasn't changed to first order for the entire Earth's history. It's changed to second order, which gives us climate variations. But those climate variations that are driven externally have a lot of internal modulators. So this is one of the most important ones. So this is wavelength of light that hits the planet, ultraviolet, visible, near infrared, far infrared, and the amount of absor absorption by various gases. And you can see that water and carbon dioxide do a lot of absorption of gases. And these are, uh, excuse me, of infrared light, which is uh, responsible for heating on the planet. These are natural gases that have risen and fallen on Earth in response to climate conditions. We've talked about positive feedbacks before. When the planet gets hotter, it evaporates more water, more water puts more water vapor into the atmosphere. And then I kind of want to draw your attention to this area here, which is called the atmospheric window. It's a part of the infrared where not complete absorption takes place. Pretty much below it and above it in wavelength, we already have absorption by the natural gases, where in this window, there's some area of transmission. And this is exactly the window where we are adding additional gases to the atmosphere that is causing the problems of global warming. This is a zoom in of that atmospheric window portion, showing you the primary gases responsible for global warming um, as we know it today. So most of these gases are natural gases, methane, nitrogen oxide and ozone, but as we've already talked about now over the past several lectures, humans have done things to impact the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, and the production of ozone in the troposphere, all of which contribute to warming, which are not natural, and which are making occurrences that are different than any time that we know of on, in past Earth. And then there's chlorofluorocarbons, which are a human invention of the 1940s, which also absorb in this region. You can also see this small shoulder of carbon dioxide. This is the CO2 that we've added to the atmosphere. You can't get higher than 100%. So adding CO2 doesn't really change that aspect of the window or this aspect of the water window. But when we add additional CO2, we broaden the shoulder. So those gases are absorbing heat. So what do we know about path climate on Earth? This is three different time slices. This is the past. 160,000 years was zero over here going into the past. This is the past 600,000 years, again, with zero over there, excuse me, 100,000 um, years. And 
this is in millions of years and they're all read the same. And so the period of time where this plot is um, depicted in this plot is up here and the period of time where this plot is depicted is up there. So you can see a couple of important things about Earth's recent climate variability. Each one of these things are change in temperature plotted relative to a global mean. A global mean is not super significant when you live in one place or another place, but it's a way that Earth scientists use the sort of normalized variations in climate between different periods of time. And so you can see this line here, 15 degrees C, was picked to be basically what the global mean is today, or as of about 20 years ago. And so you can see that there have been periods of time where it's warm, periods of time where it's cool, fluctuations, periods of time where it's warm in the past. These are what are called interglacial periods. These are called glacials or ice ages. The transition moving forward in time out of an ice age into a warm period is fast, and the transition from a warm period into an ice age is slow. And we'll talk about the nature and source of those variations in a moment, but you can see that the these kinds of variations have persisted for about a million years uh, on the planet. And then if we go further back in time, that's what's depicted here, those variations get smaller. It gets smaller and the planet gets warmer. And if we go back and back until about 65 million years ago, or everyone knows what happened 65 million years ago, dinosaurs went away. Uh, there's various um, you know, theories about what happened, such as a large impact of hitting the Earth. But, from a climate perspective, what's important is that's when we started to have continental drift that fundamentally changed the way the ocean circulated. We used to not have a continent over our southern pole, for instance. And we know that conditions of carbon dioxide, we'll talk about how we know that in a few slides, back here at that period of time are roughly the same as what we put them into now. And you can read off that chart, the temperature variations is about 10 degrees warmer globally for the whole average, not just, you know, here in Hawaii or at one particular place, but the global average was a lot warmer. And we went through this transition of several tens of millions of years where there was none of this wiggliness. And then there started to be the wiggliness. And the wiggliness has to do with orbital forcing that causes these kinds of variations, as we saw in this. And we'll talk about those a little bit more in a second. Now, we also know if we go deeper in time than this, that the sort of modern quaternary era and late, latest parts of um, the Paleogene before that are not the only times that we've had glaciation on Earth. So there's some other periods of time where we've had deglaciation and, uh, and glaciation. And we know this primarily from the geological record, primarily from rock deposits left by um, in the geological record by glaciers, as well as some isotopic evidence, which I'll talk about uh, in a few slides. But the farther back we go in time, the more uncertain uncertainty we have about a lot of these things. So how do we know about the sort of extent of glaciation during the last ice age? That's the simplest one. The maximum of the last glaciation was about 24,000 years ago. We know it through a series of things, such as the extensiveness of ice deposits, which, you know, at the margins of ice shelves, they deposit little bits of debris on the seabed called ice rapid debris, or IRD, which you can see in cores. And obviously, we have terminal moraines on the continents. And um, in addition, we can look at aquatic fossils in both terrestrial and marine environments, we can look at pollen, what kind of trees are living in the Mediterranean today versus in the past when it's a lot cooler. We can actually see the differences in the pollen recorded in sediments, which can be dated. The very types of sediments that exist helps a lot. Um, going back about 250,000 years, we have ice cores, direct evidence of what the atmosphere looked like. We'll talk about that in a moment. We have the glacial deposits. And then we have stable oxygen and hydrogen isotopic record. And for our purposes here, you just need to know that the primary form of oxygen is oxygen 16, but there's another fairly abundant form, oxygen 18, which is heavier hydrogen comes with hydrogen and deuterium. And there's a lot of different ways we can cause what we call isotopic fractionation, but the most important one 
is that during the evaporation of water, which as you can imagine, as the global temperature profile changes, we evaporate more or less water depending on how hot the planet is and it goes into the atmosphere. During hot periods of time, we evaporate relatively more of the oxygen, 18, the heavier water. And during um, warm periods of time, we also evaporate more of the heavier hydrogen, the deuterium. During cold periods of time, such as reflected uh, during ice ages, we evaporate relatively less. So when we go and look at that subcomposition of the ice cores, we see variations in what was in the atmosphere, which was essentially all fed from what was in the oceans. And so we know is that during this, between this last ice age and today, there was about a five degree globally average temperature variation between an ice age and not an ice age. So you can just sort of digest that for a moment and see how sensitive the planet is in its current configuration, how the continents are set up and how the oceans circulate, how heat, heat is transferred around the globe by the various modulating forces that do it. All it takes is about five degrees globally average to go between a period of significant cooling and significant warming. And so we're talking about that same magnitude of change in the future. You can imagine that we'll probably have an ice-free future um, if that's the case, because the amount of temperature variation that happens at the poles is much greater than the average, and the amount that happens at the equator is much less. So this is um, two views of Earth from space. that are satellite composite images, and what are meant to compare ice cover to some sort of average. So this is from something called the IPCC uh, draft report. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is a UN sanctioned group that has been making climate assessments. It's all scientific experts. They're also economists and political scientists and so forth. But the, uh, I'm only gonna talk about the science assessments today. And they've been doing this since the late 80s. They come out with a new report every four to seven years. It's not been super consistent, but I have pictures from various ones of their reports in here, in part because it's interesting to look at this historically and how the assessments have changed. Scientists tend to be fairly conservative, uh, which in hindsight was a mistake because basically they picked the um, least um, dramatic scenarios to say, look what's happening. And, politicians basically say, oh, look, it's not such a big deal. But there is a big deal. And we'll see that pretty much every time a new report comes out and we look back at the predictions that were made, the rate of climate change has accelerated relative to the predictions in the report. So this is ice cover. And the yellow line is basically the average from 1979 to 2012. And this is the measurements in September of 2012. So you can see in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, at this time, Greenland was still completely covered with ice. It's now starting to show significant erosion in the ice sheets on the West Coast. And the polar region was covered in what's called sea ice, but there had already been a significant narrowing of the extent of ice in September. September is when the maximum melting happens in the northern hemisphere. You can see in Antarctica at this time, there wasn't a whole lot of difference between the yellow line and the white line, which is important because of um, vastly greater quantity of ice stored in the Antarctic ice sheet than in the Greenland ice sheet. And basically the purpose of the sea ice here, or its role, I guess we should say, is that it holds back the land glaciers from flowing out into the ocean. It pins them onto the continent. This has significantly eroded in the last five years, not all year, but during parts of time during the year, leading us to, to believe that there could be catastrophic collapses of that ice sheet, um, as ha there have been in the past. So this is how we use ice to reconstruct um, recent paleoclimate records, recent meaning uh, to a geologist the last uh, couple hundred thousand years or so. So when seawater evaporates and we are in a warm period of time, we evaporate a relatively enriched amount of oxygen-18. That is delta O18. It's just a reference um, of the value of oxygen-18 relative to 16 in the water minus a standard presented in delta units, which are parts per thousand. And so what happens during warm periods of time is that the ocean, well, excuse me, the atmosphere gets isotopically heavy, which leaves the surface ocean, which is where the water comes from, isotopically depleted. 
They're not on the same scale. I'll just make this simple for you. The amount that C water varies, which is a mirror image because it's the complement of seawater is a lot less uh, than, than ice sheets. But in any event, during warm periods of time, the water in the oceans gets isotopically like the water in the atmosphere gets isotopically heavy, and the ice sheets are sourced from water in the atmosphere. So we see the same thing in the ice sheets as we see in the atmosphere. So we have this inverse correlation. So we can look back in time in ice cores, and the deeper we go into the ice sheets, the more complicated we have corrections for things like flow and deformation and so forth. But then able to confidently go back to about 250,000 meters in Vostok and um, uh, Antarctica. And in the oceans, we're left with this complement. And as you can imagine, marine organisms that make calcium carbonate shells that live in that seawater are going to have a calcium carbonate that has an oxygen isotopic composition, which is in equilibrium with seawater. We have marine sedimentary records going back much, much longer, you know, current oceans to about 100 million years, but in paleo oceans and for reconstructing climate records further in the past, we can go back throughout almost all of our history and look at this value and get a feeling for what we think that's the oxygen isotopic composition of the water. So these are what we call proxy records. So what those proxy records tell us, and we can look in sediments, we have the nice benefit of having geographic control. We can look at sediments in equatorial regions and uh, polar regions and temperate regions and different ocean basins, and we can look at the currents and the gyres and all that stuff. It tells us that in the past and um, through today for the current time, there were these temperature variations at Earth's surface. The global mean is fine, but what drives climate variations is the gradient of temperature between the poles and the equator. So that during warm periods of time, globally warm, what's really warming up are the poles. There's less variation, there's less gradient between the equator and the poles. The equator doesn't change by that much, maybe a degree during an ice age and a cold period, or maybe less. The poles can change something like eight degrees, 10 degrees C, and that's really what's fluctuating. <clears throat> and when we look at those records of how things have varied in the past, we can ask ourselves, well, what kinds of things control the climate on the earth? And this is just, a list of the sort of six top things, right? Some of these things are controlled externally to the Earth. The solar intensity, which has to do with how we orbit the sun, Earth's orbital fluctuations. This one's how, how we uh, orbit the sun, I should say. Solar intensity is just the sun itself, sunspot cycle, um, and other longer term variations <coughs> in a radiance that comes from the sun to the Earth. And then meteor and comet impact, which are external. Then internal controls on climate. And we see these things showing up. They're part of what accounts for the long-term tens to hundreds of millions of years variation on the planet, are variations in global tectonism, how fast are we creating oceanic crust at ocean spreading centers, which is largely a function of how much subduction we have at a given time, how much volcanism are we having? There are periods of time, like right now is a relatively low volcanism period on Earth, but there will be periods of time with a lot of volcanism. Volcanism well, puts carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which warms the atmosphere. It also puts sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere, which cools the atmosphere. So it's complicated. And then, of course, we have the bias, right? And all of the carbon cycle and the living biomass and the biomass that is fossilized and stored in the rock record, both as organic carbon, such as coal and petroleum, or shell matter like calcium carbonate sediments, is an important part of the carbon cycle because the carbon that's in those materials is not in the atmosphere. So all of these things contribute on different timescales. Timescales end up being very important. So this is just um, a depiction of some of the things that cause carbon in the atmosphere to vary and their relative rates of time associated with them. So for instance, carbon dioxide dissolving into water is a fast process, but the mixing of the oceans is a fairly slow process. The um, growth of the biosphere by fertilization of CO2 from the atmosphere, as well as the sort of denuding of the landscape by deforestation in one or another process is relatively fast. We can see the effects of these things um, over you know, recent history, meaning, for instance, when the Europeans first colonized the Americas, we can see the responses of the system within about a decade. And that's around the time scale of that. Now, things like burning of fossil fuels, we are pulling carbon that has been stored geologically in the Earth's 
uh, interior isolated from the carbon cycle very fast. Carbon that took hundreds of millions of years to accumulate in those deposits, we've managed to burn in just a couple hundred years. So geologically speaking, it's very fast. We'll see in a second that the amount of carbon that we put in is big, but it's not big compared to the amount of carbon that's already in these various reservoirs. It's the rate, which is really the problem. Another thing that happens is the natural weathering of organic rich deposits or carbonate sediments when they reach the land surface. And this is a generally slow process. It's been slow over Earth's history. It happens, but not very quickly. And this is an, uh, another diagram from uh, that 2013 IPCC report where they put some actual times on some processes. So you can see that, for instance, gas exchange uh, at the surface of the ocean is something like one to 10 years, but that's only talking about the upper surface layer because the oceans take a couple thousand years to circulate. The time scale for equilibrating the atmosphere with the entire oceans is something like 10 times as much. That's more to do with the way the oceans currently circulate than the chemistry of CO2 dissolving in water, which is controls this. You see that photosynthesis is relatively quick. There's the time scale associated with volcanism because it's so punctuated and, and variation uh, through time are great. But you can also see there's some numbers here that have a lot of question marks to them or big ranges like soil. Soils are complicated because the soil in an unperturbed old growth forested ecosystem is going to be very different than our agricultural soil in terms of how much carbon is stored in the soil in the form of biomass, partially degraded in many cases, versus how much of it re emits back into the atmosphere. And the more we disrupt soils, the more we ruin their ability to hold carbon and it goes back into the atmosphere. So when we put together all the various parameters, of how long we think a spike of carbon into the atmosphere will take to re-equilibrate. This plot gives you an idea. This is in picogram, uh, excuse me, um, P's are uh, pet petagrams, petagrams of carbon, sorry. Uh, and so you can see here that there's three boxes, this is zero to 200 years, 200 to 2,000 years, 2,000 years to 10,000. So when we put a spike in the atmosphere, and we wait 200 years, and just out of interest sake, the start of the Industrial Revolution is usually put with Eli Whitney and the cotton gin at 1783. So we're a little more than 200 years on. So carbon, we started putting into the atmosphere in 200 years, something like 3,000 out of 5,000, which is 60% is still in the atmosphere. Some amount is taken up by the land and some amount is taken up by the ocean. If we wait long enough, more and more ends up um, getting into the oceans. And if we wait long enough, it's not depicted on this diagram. You see here, we have we start to have reactions with igneous rock, enhanced weathering rates, but that's over 100,000 year time scale. So it doesn't play into this diagram. But you can see here that it's going to take something like two to 10,000 years for the atmosphere to be back down to only having 20% of what we've added to the atmosphere. That's what this time scale tells us. Even at 10,000 years, we're still at a value of 1,000, which means that most, even though most of the uh, CO2 we've added to the atmosphere will eventually end up in the ocean. It's something a little more than half, and some of it will end up in the land biosphere. Some of it's gonna stay in the ocean. That's how it works when we apportion between reservoirs. You've seen this slide a bunch of times already. I just want to remind you of it. The way the oceans currently circulate have a lot to do with where we make the coldest, densest water and the configuration of the continents. Imagine during an ice age, when you put an ice sheet across here, this whole area is ice sheet. We slow down deep water formation in the North Atlantic. Now, this kind of circulation pattern in the North Atlantic is called AMOC, which is Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. So we think that that overturning circulation goes down. However, there's also evidence that vertical circulation elsewhere in the ocean goes up. So that during ice ages, water is more, or the atmosphere is um, able to aerate more of the ocean than it does during warm periods of time. Now think for a second about what the future might be like when there's no ice up here. 
and the water's a lot warmer. We've had glacial runoff, and it's making the water fresher. It's going to make it more difficult to make water cold enough and dense enough to be able to sink like this. So it's going to slow down the animal. And this is something that's already started to be observed, especially in the Labrador Sea and um, areas up here periodically uh, of the North Atlantic. So we can anticipate all of the things that this conveyor belt that we know and love have um, brought us, such as the way climate is variable around the planet and temperatures are modulated by the circulating water masses and inner masses are going to change because this is one of the major controls. It's not a control on the global average temperature, but it's a control on variation. So most of you probably already know this, but starting sometime back in the 19, uh, well, or uh, all the way back in the 1870s, people started to recognize that there were climate variations and hypothesized that maybe uh, there was something about how the sun was insulating the earth. But it was in the 30s, this guy Milankovitch looked at three components of Earth's orbit around the sun, which, ha which are, have different periodicities. One of them has to do with the eccentricity of our orbit. One of them has to do with our tilt towards the sun. And one of them has to do with the wobble. And each one of these accounts for, they have a different time scale associated with them and it accounts for a certain amount of solar radiance variation around the globe. So when you add those three components together, this is what's called the Northern Hemisphere um, Summer Insulation Curve in watts per meter squared, just like that map I showed you early on. And you can calculate these for any latitude you want, and people argue what's the most you know, useful latitude for reconstructing the past, and it depends on when in the past you're looking for the continents that have always been in the same place. But it's basically showing you fluctuations in the amount of heat we receive from the sun, just as a function of how Earth orbits the sun. And these are those same three uh, components of the Milankovitch cycles. These are a bunch of different proxy records. Uh, this is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, for instance. This is tropical sea surface temperature. Sea surface temperatures are reconstructed by looking at the strontium calcium ratio in corals, which put down annual bands, many of them shallow water coral too. This is um, Antarctic temperature reconstruction. This is done with the deuterium hydrogen ratio of the water and the ice. This is benthic, delta oxygen 18, benthic means the deep ocean. So these are variations in the deep water mass oxygen isotopic composition of seawater as recorded by shells of organisms living there. And this is a record, a couple records, two different records of sea level. And what you can see in all of them is these same wiggles. And these wiggles um, are very closely matched by this pattern. So while we know that Earth's orbital parameters around the sun are not the only thing that varies climate, we know that over the last couple hundred thousand years to half a million years when climate has been very variable, that there's a very direct one-to-one -one correlation. Furthermore, this is another record from the Vostok Space Core. This is, um, I, this is zero here going back in time. So I like to look at this in this direction as we move forward in time. This is the temperature reconstruction of the Vostok Ice Core warm periods of time, cold periods of time. So this is the last ice age, this is today. This is the last interglacial, which out of interest say happened to be when the Evo Plain, which is a coral reef, was deposited when sea level is a little higher. And these are gas concentrations. Ice gets trapped in gas, in little bubbles, and we can melt the ice, and we can look at the gas in different layers and see how that varies. This is methane, this is CO2. You have to squint and look very closely, but what you will see is that the gas concentrations lag or follow the temperature variation. So temperature comes first and then the gases start to change. When the gases change in the atmosphere, the gas is trapped in the ice core changes as well. So it turns out that the temperature variations are being driven by the orbital parameters and modulated by the carbon cycle. The carbon cycle can magnify those variations through the atmospheric window that we talked about. This is one way of thinking about how Earth works from the perspective of the last half a million years or so, and from the perspective of the starting point for anthropogenic climate change, which is the warm periods of time. The interglacials kind of represent the normal, if you will, periods of time. They have fully functioning biogeochemical exchanges between the land biota and the marine biota, and they're putting a fully um, functioning amount of CO2 and methane into the atmosphere. 
And then when the insulation goes down because of this orbital forcing, the planet starts to cool, it grows ice caps, that lowers the sea level, uh, that changes the carbon cycle and pulls carbon dioxide and methane from the atmosphere, which enhances the effect and causes the planet to grow even more ice sheets and become cold. And something bounces us back out. As we've seen from a lot of these diagrams, we bounce out of glacials really quickly. So if nothing else, what this should tell you is that whatever drives the forces of going from cold to warm are much, much faster than the forces that drive us going from warm to cold. And this is repeated in every glacial interglacial cycle of the last 200, or, or excuse me, 2 million years. This is just a table, gives you a little bit more detail. I'm not gonna read through it. You can look at it in your note. It comes from Wally Broker's book in the 80s, Habitable, How to Build a Habitable Planet but it explains in more detail some of the things that I just talked about, such as how winds play a role and how albedo plays a role, et cetera. But what we know from all this stuff is that over the last couple million years of Earth's history, temperatures have fluctuated on Earth for very natural reasons. They've risen, they've fallen, the climate variations are driven by solar insulation and enhanced by carbon cycle variation. So really the question that scientists have had and you know they've known about this phenomenon for something like 70 years um, by that time by the 80s when i was learning about this this was pretty much settled science the nature of the amount of change and how we would notice things at a local level are things that took more time to figure out but you know when anyone tells you that global warming oh we didn't notice it was actually happening until 10 years ago that's, that's just political nonsense. We've known this for many, many decades. But the question is, is, how are the gases that are being added by human activities perturbing this natural balance? How much, to what extent? And it's not just the gases. There are plenty of other things that humans do. As we've talked about with the global atmosphere, we put particulates into the atmosphere, we change the reactivity of the atmosphere, we change the proportion of ozone in the atmosphere, we change the distribution of materials on the land surface, where we're using energy, how we're putting it into the atmosphere, how the Earth's albedo changes in response to deforestation and other processes. We're changing a lot of stuff. And some of these things have impacts that are very immediate, and some of them have impacts that take more time. So we really kind of want to understand the variations. And the data that we know about quite well, because the petroleum industry and the construction industry keep really good records of how much greenhouse gases they or greenhouse gas producing potential they've pulled out of the ground in the past couple hundred years. So we know this. It's getting a little bit dicier, and we'll see. We're going to move into talking about energy in the next couple of weeks. There are some countries like China and Saudi Arabia that purposely screw with their numbers to try and make them look different than they really are for political reasons. But for most of the period of time, we have pretty good production, production records for the greenhouse gases. So the question is really is, is, well, so what's that going to look like in terms of weather? especially where you live or someone else lives, your parents or friends. And it's important to note that many of these things come from models. And models require very complicated understanding of the interplays on all sorts of different time scales and spatial scales of various processes, plus a ton of computing power. And these have definitely gotten better and better and better as time has moved forward so that we can make better predictions now than we could five years ago or 10 years ago. And this is one of the reasons why the IPCC reports keep having more refined predictions. But basically, the predictions haven't changed since about 1990. They've gotten a little bit more, um, like I said, a little bit more accurate. And we can go back and we can reproduce various um, conditions that we have measurements for more and more accurately. But really, when we employ the models, the biggest uncertainty is human behavior, right? How much are we going to limit the amount of greenhouse gas loading in the atmosphere? There's scenarios which um, encompass a much bigger range of potential change than uncertainty in the models at this stage. And those, that's a human uncertainty that we just don't have an answer for. So this is the sort of data starting in 1860, sort of mid of the uh, 1900s, when we really started using, uh, first it was coal, and then um, you know we switched into petroleum later in the century. There's a little bit of CO2 loading from um, cement production in here as well. But this is a production record from 1860 to the year 2000 of carbon. 
right? And you can see there's kind of a pause here during the Great Depression and leading into World War II, but otherwise it's been a pretty straight upward path. And so as long ago as the 1940s, this guy named Roger Revelle proposed that all the CO2 is going in the atmosphere is probably going to cause global warming. Um, he wasn't the first person to propose it, but he's probably the most prominent person to propose it. And so um, this was sort of unknown, but what, what wasn't known is how much is in the atmosphere, how fast has it been rising in the atmosphere. But one of the things he did when he was director of Scripps Institutional Oceanography in the late 50s was convince a brand new postdoc named Charles Keeling to like, hey, come to Scripps from Caltech and start measuring carbon dioxide at Mauna Loa, which should be a really good place to measure it because it's high up and it's equatorial and it's got an unpolluted atmosphere and it's in the middle of the ocean. And so this guy did that. He staked his whole career on it. This is what he started to measure, this up and down wiggles. So you can imagine this is the guy who's like just out of grad school and his whole career is on the basis of this. And, and I'm sure he was pretty demoralized by seeing these variations and not really understanding what they were. But by the mid 60s, it was clear that if you just drew a line through the midpoint of every curve, and this wiggles have to do with seasonality of the carbon loading in the atmosphere because of the marine and the terrestrial biosphere, which have seasonality to them. And in the northern hemisphere, there's a certain forcing function, and the southern hemisphere is off by um, six months. But if you just connect the midpoints of these curves, you can start to see them going up and going up and going up and going up. And this curve went to about the year 2005. And you can go to this website yourself, www.co2.earth, and you can look it up. What, what's the concentration today in the atmosphere? And it turns out that the highest concentration is usually in March of each year. And I just looked at it and it was 421 people. And so you can see here that, you know, in March it was uh, of 2012, it's 394 ppm. So you can calculate what that percentage variation was. And as we'll see in a second, if we could take this curve all the way back to the start of the Industrial Revolution, which we have to do using ice cores, we you know that we started at about 280 people. And so that's a significant increase, 140 ppm. That's about 50% more than what was there just a couple hundred years ago. And this is just a snapshot from that website. So how do we go further back in the past? We go back into the past using uh, an ice core record. So ice cores have various things about them which allow us to tell time. There's um, usually dust deposits that delineate individual years. There's a period of time, there was a slide near the end of last time that I didn't get to, it's in the packet that explains that when snow falls on an ice cap and then it starts to coalesce and condense. We still have exchange with the atmosphere. It goes through this stage called fern, and then it eventually compresses to become ice. It's about a 10-year period. It depends. Each place is a little bit different. But so there's a little bit of a correction that needs to be made. But in any event, um, you can go back in time with the ice core by measuring the amount of gas that's dissolved in the ice. And so this is the direct measurements. That's the connecting of the midpoints of these lines, the blue line from that diagram. And then the, these dots are individual ice core records going back to the start of the Industrial Revolution. You can see the concentration going down. This is how we know that it was 280 ppm at the start of the Industrial Revolution. And this has been measured in you know ice cores from a lot of different places. Now, we also know even though we weren't making direct measurements of these other major atmospheric greenhouse gases directly for as long as measuring CO2, the methane, the nitrous oxide, and um, the chlorofluorocarbons, especially CFC11, when we look in the ice cores, we see a similar pattern, okay? Except for CFC11, because we only invented and introduced it in the 40s. So it only starts to show up in the 50s. So that's good. Um, we don't have any of this stuff in the ice before that time, but we do have these other gases. And so here's the kicker, they're all increasing and the rate of the increasing has been accelerating. That's driven entirely 100% by human activities. And when we look at these various other gases relative to carbon dioxide, even though the concentrations are a lot smaller, their effect in terms of how much greenhouse gas they absorb is higher. So methane is about 20 times as effective molecule per molecule as CO2. N2O is about 300 times as effective, and chlorofluorocarbons are 10,000 times. So we don't have to put very much of them in the atmosphere to start to have a big effect on this atmospheric window and the amount of absorption of infrared that we're doing. We also have to think about the lifetimes. 
So for all those gases, right, the CO2 goes in and comes out on time scales of years or probably decades. It's very variable and, and complicated because there's a fair amount of it. And, and we've so perturbed the system, it's really difficult to determine how much it is and it's geographically variable as well. But the other gases that are important from the last slide, the N2O, that takes like a century. So we add it to the atmosphere, it doesn't come out right away. CFCs probably take more than 50 years. So again, something like a half a century. So we can limit this and start to see some impact, but you saw from that earlier slide I showed you, it can still take something like 10,000 years for the vast majority of the CO2 we put into the atmosphere to be recovered again. Um, and these gases stay a lot longer than that. Now, methane has a relatively short residence time. And when methane um, decomposes in the atmosphere, it oxidizes to make CO2. That's its primary fate. So just the relatively small amount of methane we're adding to the atmosphere just adds to the CO2 pool. But when it's in this form, it's much more effective as a greenhouse gas modulator. So in the short term variation of greenhouse gas and global warming, methane is something to focus on. But for a long term impact, it's probably not as important as some of the other gases. So you might say, well, where's all this coming from? So this is um, some mean percentages over uh, since the start of the Industrial Revolution, something like three quarters of the greenhouse gas atmosphere, in the atmosphere, primarily CO2, comes from fossil fuels, a couple percent from cement production, about a quarter from deforestation. So these are the kind of breakdowns by different regions of the globe. You can see you know, your favorite place. Um, it's pretty well distributed. And that, in fact, this is about a 20 year old plot. The plots would look different if we were looking at them today. So this is just a breakdown of how CO2 related to uh, hydrocarbon burning is distributed between biomass burning, coal, natural gas, petroleum, and how many vehicles. This is a pretty split up pie. There's a one piece that's the dominant one. The same thing with CFCs. Many processes are responsible for putting in the atmosphere. Okay, so one of the things that we really want to think about is what's the role of the carbon cycle and perturbations of the carbon cycle that humans have done in putting carbon into the atmosphere. What are the time scales? What are the reservoir sizes? And why are we seeing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere that we are seeing? So one of the things that we know between the sort of 1860s and the 1980s, before carbon loading in the atmosphere just went completely crazy, the 90s and since the year 2000, it's been much harder to track this because the inputs have gotten so much bigger. Um, but from that period of time, we saw the atmosphere of CO2 rise by about 20%. Now we know now we're more like 50%, but during that, we can do these mass balances more easily. The fossil fuels that were exploitable on the planet, known and exploitable, had only diminished by three tenths of a percent. So that gives you the idea that since we know that the fossil fuels are the dominant source of the rise in CO2, and the amount that they diminish by is immeasurably um, you know, small, that there's plenty of fossil fuels to keep messing up the atmosphere. That's the takeaway. Now, when we look at the other um, reservoirs where we think carbon can go, which is primarily terrestrial plant biomass and the surface oceans, we saw concentrations changing, but difficult to pinpoint because of annual fluctuations and various other complicating factors, such as deforestation, for instance. So we know that the amount that the carbon should have risen in the atmosphere, if none of it went here, that would have been about twice as much. And so by presumption, the other half that didn't stay in the atmosphere redistributed into these other reservoirs. The rates and the amounts and the geographic variation are difficult to determine, but this is sort of how it is oftentimes depicted as a loading of carbon per year, which through about the year 2000 was about six gigatons, 6.3 is, is the plot here. We're much higher than that now, uh, unfortunately. And again, it's, it's, this is a fossil fuel and cement together. And then the deforestation of that piece of the pie, which was uh, on a few slides ago, was not in here. This is just the production. Net terrestrial uptake accounts for biomass increase of pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere plus deforestation, which is, of course, putting CO2 back in the atmosphere 
net oceanic uptake, net atmospheric storage. So you can see that you know this number is roughly half of that number. And so oftentimes this other half was called the missing carbon, uh, meaning the carbon that somehow managed to redistribute itself into these other reservoirs. And people argued for a long time about the relative amounts and the rates um, in terms of if we're going to make a change, uh, how do we make these reservoirs absorb more of the carbon and less of it stay in the atmosphere? But the net result is, is that something like half the carbon on a short time scale that we put in the atmosphere stays in the atmosphere. Okay, now this is a diagram that shows you the carbon cycle um, as of sort of 1980 or so. So we can see the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere, 750, it was estimated to be about 600 in the year 1860. We can see the amount of carbon that's in the surface oceans, a little bit more than that. When we get to the whole of the deep oceans, right, so there's way more carbon. So if we wait long enough, as per that slide I showed you with the 10,000 years, eventually the carbon is going to go in the oceans. But because of the way they circulate, not very much of it is in exchange with the atmosphere. Marine biota and dissolved organic carbon are relatively small numbers, as are surface sediments. Um, vegetation soils and detritus added together are you know, something like three times as much. But as we already looked at um, early on, the rates of exchange are such that just because we put something in the atmosphere, it doesn't automatically reapportion it into the other reservoirs. It can take a decade to multiple decades to a century. And that's part of the gist of why we load so much carbon into the atmosphere. And even over geological time scales, it apportions itself into these reservoirs and reservoirs that aren't even shown here, like um, deeper uh, carbon based sediments, not on the surface, but further down in the ocean basins have even more carbon. But we just don't have access to those reservoirs on the time scales that we are perturbing the atmosphere. So you can make sort of uh, various kinds of assumptions, but if you can say that, like in 1860, kind of at the start of when we really started using petroleum, the system was kind of closer to equilibrium, chemical equilibrium of carbon between all the various reservoirs in the carbon cycle, then now it's really out of equilibrium, right? And we know that about half of the anthropogenically forced carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that we've put there is, is still there in the atmosphere, and the other half is oftentimes referred to as the missing carbon, although as time has moved forward, fewer and fewer people use this term because we think we know where pretty much all of it is. Now, some people argue that we started perturbing as humans climate way longer ago. This guy, Bill Rudman, was a climate scientist. I think he's, he's still alive, but he's retired. This is a really good book if you want to read it. It basically describes how he thinks and the evidence for it. There's lots of plots how humans started perturbing climate something like 10,000 years ago when we first started you know, developing rice, uh, which puts a lot of methane in the atmosphere, as well as uh, terrestrial agriculture, the sort of growing of wheat and so forth, and the role of human disease on climate. When a lot of humans die, we end up having sort of reforestation of areas of Europe. There was a big uh, mass die-off of the indigenous people in North America and South America when the Europeans first came that hasn't been super well documented, but you can see it in, you know, when a lot of people die off, forests start to recover. And so the, the, a lot of the eastern seaboard of North America became forested whereas it probably wasn't forested for several centuries before that when there were more people living there uh, after the Europeans came and brought their disease with them. And so we start to see forests come back in a pull down of greenhouse gases. And so the kind of competing forces between the things, you know, human warfare, human disease, and human impacts on agriculture probably started to change our atmosphere something like 10,000 years ago which is really the sort of official end of the last ice age, 10 or 11,000 years ago. But importantly, those variations are small compared to the human variations that we've induced since 1860. So we're talking about different orders of magnitude. So this is important and interesting and useful to think about um, how long have humans been impacting because it gives us a baseline from where should we be thinking about the atmosphere as quote unquote equilibrium but um, 
it doesn't rewrite the story about um, global warming from the human perspective. So um, really the um, greatest concern for humans is the rates of exchanges that we've already sort of talked about. And um, I think what the amount of carbon dioxide that's been added to various reservoirs versus staying in the oceans and that has been impacted by human activities, fossil fuel burning, deforestation, and um, uh, cement production are accelerating at a rate that is very difficult. That since we didn't know what the time scales were, you know, when things were happening more slowly between sort of 1860 and 1980, is becoming even more difficult to pinpoint the exact rates of change. This is just a slide that kind of explains why the oceans um, are a much smaller reservoir over short term uh, for carbon dioxide because only the top part of the reservoir fully exchanges with the atmosphere. So the average ocean depth is about four kilometers and the top 100 meters yeah, is fully effective. The bottom part is not very effective. This number comes from the circulation uh, time scales, which come from radiocarbon dating of carbon and seawater. There's a zone of mixing in between. And so you can calculate that the oceans effectively act like a reservoir, about one tenth the size that they would be if they circulated more quickly. Deforestation is a very complicated thing too, because um, the amount of deforestation that's happening today is different than it was in the past several hundred years because of colonial activity and um, places that uh, lost their forests a couple hundred years ago or 300 years ago or 400 years ago are no longer contributing to global warming. They did contribute, but the places that are contributing today, it's just listed the biggest countries in terms of deforestation, Brazil by far the largest in terms of acreage. And you can see that um, the amount of deforestation is primarily in tropical regions. There's actually been a decline in temperate regions through reforestation. And this is what the net ends up looking like. So there's a big spike that happens here, sort of like 1950, 1960 in, in deforestation rate, which again is an acceleration of greenhouse gas moving in the Okay, so now let's talk about global warming. This is a diagram and the purpose of giving you something um, quote unquote old or historic. This is from 2001. Okay, this is a Scientific American article. And it basically shows you, here's the CO2 record, which we've already talked about. This is the combination of the atmospheric record with the ice core record going back, um, you know, over the last thousand years. And this is temperature record in red, the global temperature record. And pink is uncertainty, which obviously gets bigger as we go back in time because thermometers weren't so good back in the dark ages. But in any event, what they knew for sure in the year 2000 was that the temperatures on Earth and the carbon dioxide on Earth were higher than any time they'd been in the past thousand years, and that the shapes of the two curves were very similar, and that there was a strong correlation. And you know, this by the time something gets into Scientific American, it's like 10 years old, right? The scientists already knew this. Everyone knew this. All these sort of Republicans in Congress in the United States and various other conservatives in other countries that were denying this were basically just ignoring the facts. These are facts. This is a more recent record. And the difference between this plot and the last plot is what you use as the reference temperature. Um, people have, this is basically a reconstruction saying that the baseline temperature between 1880 and 1920 was, was zero. It's a relative variation in temperature relative to that period of time people had been using a more recent period of time and were missing, they were, they were missing some of the temperature variation. But what you get out of this plot is that through most of the end of the 19th century and a similar part of the 20th century, temperature didn't vary by very much, right? A couple of tenths of a degree. But since about 1980, it's been steadily increasing, right? And this goes through the year 2020. And so you can see that now we know globally Temperatures are more than a degree warmer in a relative sense than they were back then. And we know why this is, right? It's because of our loading of the atmosphere. So this is a, a temperature profile over the North Pole. Um, this is temperature anomalies, again, relative to a baseline temperature, starting in the year 1950, the year 2020, 
one, and you can see these deep red colors are warmer, up to five degrees C, and where there was blue, it was cooler. And then at the start of this time period, it was kind of mixed, there was some warm and some cool. But as we get into these more recent years, we see warming everywhere. And in the context of warming everywhere of three to five degrees C, there's really not much hope for maintaining ice year round in the North Pole. So these are some other proxy records um, from one of the IPCC reports. And I've given you for um, interest, if you want to go to their website, you can go and you can see there was a late, the latest report was 2022. Um, you know, the plots change how they look a little bit in terms of like what colors and fonts and stuff they use, but the, the details haven't changed all that much of the data. Some of the predictions uh, have changed. But so you can see here, here's global mean temperature, starting the year 1850 to the year 2000. This is global average sea level. This is Northern hemisphere snow cover. These two are clearly showing an increase over uh, that period of time. Um, and so you can ask yourself the question, okay, you know, irrespective of whether humans have changed the atmosphere or not, which we know we have, when was the last time that um, CO2 was as high as it is today, and how has it varied over Earth history? So we know, for instance, it was 280 ppm in 1750. Uh, we know that it was only 180 ppm at the glass glacial maximum. We now have it at 420 or so. The last time the carbon dioxide was over 375, which was like our um, value in about the year I'd say something like 2005 or 2006 was in the Oligocene, right? Which is here, where we weren't really seeing as many climate wiggles and where Earth was six degrees warm. Okay. So, presumably, in a fully functioning equilibrium sense, if our carbon loading in the atmosphere would stop here, this is, this is where we'll end up. And six degrees is a gigantic variation because six degrees global average means something much greater in the polar region, probably something like 12 to 15 degrees and much less at uh, the equator. So I think it's safe to say it's gonna get a lot warmer uh, before it cools down. Now, some people have argued that the um, greenhouse gas loading in the atmosphere comes at an unfortunate time. You know, this is the sort of um, temperature swings between the last interglacial, the last glacial maximum and today. And if we had added our gases at a different period of time, maybe it wouldn't be so extreme, but that the orbital forcing of the planet is going to eventually pull us back down into an ice age. And it is possible, except one of the things that we've learned over the last sort of 10 to 15 years, is there are various tipping points in the system that allowed it to follow this pattern of behavior, such as the formation of ice sheets in the Northern and Southern hemispheres that don't completely go away during the summertime. And that there were periods of time in the deep past, like as we see here, where we didn't have those same cycles because we didn't have any ice there. So if we reach that tipping point where we melt the ice, there's no uh, guarantee that we're gonna go back into an ice. There's, we don't know. So this is another um, diagram from, from the Runnaman book, basically looking at sort of quote unquote natural trend um, and the impact of greenhouse gas loading of the atmosphere with a bunch of question marks about you know, how, how high are we going to load it. But if this doesn't recover back down to concentrations below a hypothesized threshold to allow glaciation, then we won't go back into our ices because we won't be able to make any ice. And this is really maybe not a question for our generation and the next generation, but it's definitely a question for 100 years from now, 300 years from now, 500 years from now. And so, you know, responsible stewards of the planet should start thinking about this problem now because it really is a problem. So here's um, um, some more information from the 2001 IPCC synthesis. So again, I'm showing you historical data because I want you to realize how long we've known this for. Um, this is um, looking at temperature variations in red in all three of these panels, and then running computer models. And these are 20-year-old computer models using pretty cruddy computers and much less well-understood um, physics. And yet, when we look at the forcing using just natural phenomena that we know of, how the carbon cycle works, how the ocean circulates, et cetera, global insulation, 
or just anthropogenic portion, we don't get a good match. But when those two components are put together, you can predict using the models pretty good. And that's what, like I say, 20 years ago, what the temperature variations were. There was essentially no question at this time that there was a certain amount of anthropogenic forcing of global climate. <clears throat> this is just a little bit more detail looking at variations, um, the sort of just the natural in blue and the anthropogenic force in pink over the globe, over the land, and over the oceans. And you can see again, significant warming in the last couple of decades. This is a regional look. You see the same thing. Doesn't matter where you look on the globe, you find the same variations starting in about the year 1980. <clears throat> this is a bunch more proxy records. The various color curves are different records superimposed on each other. So this is the land um, surface air temperature, sea surface temperature, marine air temperature, sea level, summer Arctic, sea ice extent. <clears throat> All of them show, you know, um, variations, increases in temperature, decreases in ice that show that um, greenhouse warming is definitely happening. This is from the 2013 report. These are gas contents in greenhouse gases shown uh, plotted in slightly different scales, but again, kind of demonstrating that going back now 10,000 years, we have never had the concentration of CO2, the concentration of N2O, or the concentration of methane that we have today and the magnitude of the variation. We're not like just tweaking it a little bit. This is the amount of natural variation over something like you know 9,000 years, and that's the amount of human-induced variation. It's a huge, huge amount of gas, and that's as recorded. Now, <clears throat> the complicated thing about these gases is they have complicated chemistry, complicated resonance times, complicated interplays with other gases and other things in the atmosphere, such as particulates and land use process. This is a table that goes through each one of the things that we've talked about that contribute to global warming. You can read it at your leisure, but it, one of the important things is to look at the atmospheric lifetimes and the relative amount of change. We've had change in more than one parameter and we can't address global warming with only one parameter. Furthermore, this is another IPCC report diagram. We've done other things to the atmosphere besides load it with greenhouse gases. So this is a plot showing us the relative amount that we've changed the heat retention in the atmosphere by doing various things. So here's the long-lived atmospheric gases that we've put into the atmosphere that we've been talking about. Um, you know, the carbon dioxide and various other gases. You can see, based on this compilation, carbon dioxide looks like something like two-thirds, and the other gases are something like one-third. We can look at ozone in the stratosphere and in the troposphere, as we've talked about. <clears throat> these are important. These are effects on temperature variations in the atmosphere by land use practices, so surface albedo, as well as adding aerosols to the atmosphere, which can take various forms. It can be sulfate aerosols. It can be black carbon aerosols. These things <clears throat> contribute to cooling. That's why they're shown in blue. There's a lot of uncertainty on some of these, but these need to be taken into account. And there have been people who say, ah, you know, the way we take care of global warming is put a bunch of particulates in the atmosphere. Problem with that, I mean, there are many problems with that. Think about all the reactive surface chemistry that happens in the atmosphere. Think about the potential impact on photosynthesis on the surface of the earth, the ecosystem variations. It's generally not a good idea to fix a problem by perturbing another aspect of the system that we don't fully understand. But so we add all these things up, the net anthropogenic effect is of course warming. <clears throat> And this is basically tries to break those down, some of the numbers associated with all the various processes on the other slides and how they contribute to that effect of, of solar radiation in the visible hitting the surface of the earth and bouncing back out and absorbing in the infrared. We've increased the ability of the atmosphere to absorb. So now we want to look at some usage scenarios. So these are, again, this is a relatively early, this is the 2001 synthesis. People have been talking about regulating CO2 for a long time. They have made absolutely no progress, in my opinion. The stuff that we've done has been piddling, um, <clears throat> including the Paris Accord. 2001, they were saying, let's cap production at 1990 levels. 1990, right? This is already well into the Industrial Revolution. We already started to accelerate. Now, 1990 levels seem like a dream. 
Just since the year 2000, China has produced more CO2 into the atmosphere than all the other countries for the rest of the time of the Industrial Revolution to the present. So what these curves are, are different scenarios. This is where the social science comes in. That's what these terms are, sort of making assumptions about, oh, well, humans might do this, right? They might keep cranking CO2 in the atmosphere with reckless abandon. They might pull us back down to 1990 levels or something in between. In these scenarios, you can then predict, well, what do we think will happen to the temperature? What do we think will happen to the climate system as we do that? <clears throat> this is from the 2013 report, more recent version of the same thing, again, with the different scenarios. That's what all these letters mean. And have different implications for what CO2 will be. Remember, we started at 180 in the last ice age, 280 at the start of the Industrial Revolution. So this most conservative scenario has it up, you know, peaking at almost 500 and then maybe coming back down to 350. That's the most conservative scenario. We'll probably never do that. And this worst sort of business as usual takes us up to 2000. I, I can't even imagine what a 2000 ppm planet would look like. <clears throat> but you can, um, you know, look at the history of CO2 emissions and figure out where it's coming from and other greenhouse gases. So this is showing us carbon dioxide growth um, <clears throat> over this century and you know the net CO2 um, from land use changes, deforestation, et cetera, the amount of methane, the amount of nitrous oxide, the amount of fluorinated gases. <clears throat> These three or four things vary less. They're all increasing, but they vary less. The main increase is still CO2. If we had to do something, limiting CO2 seems logical. <clears throat> These are the proposed uh, possible carbon dioxide concentrations for, again, different scenarios. FAR is the most conservative, going back to 1990 levels of production. It's still going to peak us well above 400. And this obviously was from a 2013 report. We're now over this amount, right? We're at 421 this year which put us somewhere here. And we're not following that pathway anyway. Or, um, <clears throat> it's a question of which one of these pathways we'll follow. And you'll notice these projections, these only go to like 10 years from now. A lot of the of problems now with the climate moderating um, <clears throat> trees are that they're looking really short term, like, oh, let's just keep CO2 good by mid-century or the year 2100. Completely screws future generations because you can do things to limit things over a short term, they're still going to have major impacts a couple hundred years down the road. So that's not sufficient. <clears throat> this shows us methane, carbon dioxide, and nitrous oxide, again, for various scenarios, um, capping in 1990 levels, so sort of business as usual. And you can see there's a pretty big variation of all of those things. We're still pretty uncertain. And these are the associated temperature changes, <clears throat> again, globally average. This just goes to the year 2030. So this is again from the um, uh, 2013 report. So like, oh, well, we'll predict two decades in the future. There's a lot of variation. There's a lot of uncertainty. These are the predictions from here over. But I think you can get an idea from this swath that somewhere between one degree and two degrees is our short-term future, right? In your lives, it will be on average that warm, much warmer on the planet. And the higher the latitude you go, the greater the effect will be. So this is um, associated sea level changes. Again, a large variation, a lot of uncertainty depending on which scenario we follow, but um, a little to a lot. Those are in centimeters, 2.5 centimeters per inch. Um, these are temperature variation patterns around the globe. We know there's a regionality to this, and this is for different loading scenarios, sort of Oh, excuse me, 2020 to 2030 and 2090 to 2099. So sort of looking at the end of the century and focus on those are these panels. And you can see, depending on the loading scenario, you get more or less temperature variation um, on the planet average. But in all three of these cases, you get the most variation in the Northern Hemisphere polar region, the next most in the Southern Hemisphere polar region, and then moderate uh, in between. And so in this worst case scenario here, which is the business as usual scenario, which we've pretty much been following, puts us at 7.5 or 8 degrees C at the North Pole by the end of the century. That is definitely an ice-free future for the North Pole, if that's what we follow. <clears throat> the other thing we can look at is predicted 
uh, patterns in global precipitation and how that will vary. Whenever I look at one of these plots, I was like, oh, like I look at Hawaii. You know, Hawaii happens to be in a part of these maps. It's not very well resolved. And people don't tend to focus on us too much. But because we're close to the equator, we're probably not going to see much temperature variation. We may see some precipitation changes. You can see that depending on which model you look at, they predict you know, either a decrease in the amount of rain or maybe not much change in the amount of rain. That's probably the biggest impact here locally. This is a figure from the textbook showing you patterns, you know, um, in, you know, different attributes of continental weather over the United States that um, are probably related to climate change. Let's have a couple of other slides. This is a couple of other things to think about. Like you probably learned about this at some point in time in a biology class that when you go up in an elevation, um, you go through climate zones very similar to the latitudinal band. So if you go to a high mountain on the equator and you go up in elevation, you go through different climate bands, you can find alpine conditions at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro, for instance, because you're high enough up, even though it's close to the equator. And <clears throat> one of the things that climate impact can be looked at in a very sort of local way without having to worry about migration patterns and other things is looking at variations as we go up a mountain over time in various kinds of parameters that are related to temperature, such as um, diseases that are trans, uh, you know, ported by mosquitoes or other pests that are really climate sensitive. They don't like freezing temperature. And so one of the things that we have found is, is that um, <clears throat> the occurrence of mosquito-borne disease, things like dengue fever and malaria, you can see them listed down here, has increased dramatically in all these different places in the world where we have relatively high elevation um, locations near the equator. So this is the last slide. The gist of the predictions for the future are that it's going to get hotter because we haven't gotten our act together in 20 or 30 years. And even as the stuff is hitting the fan, we're seeing more extreme weather and everything else, the political forces are probably not going to modulate greenhouse gas loading over any time soon. It's going to get hotter. It's going to get hotter, more hot near the uh, poles and the equator. And rain patterns are going to vary a lot. Human disease is going to vary a lot around the globe, especially diseases that are, are um, transported by organisms that like warm climate conditions. And this has been these other predictions out there now for a couple of decades about the intensity of energy in the atmosphere increasing as we warm the planet. As we warm the planet overall, you can find some parts of the atmosphere that cool and some that warm, um, partly because of the reapportionment of particulates and the way we absorb or reflect light in different places. But these are three sort of, this is like um, variations in temperature and um, um, for, for sort of different scenarios of how, you know, how warming might happen. And the bottom line is that weather patterns on a planet follow some kind of Gaussian distribution. There are other sort of local factors or unpredictable factors that the states and also decide that this hurricane is going to become this intense or not, or this tornado season is going to be more intense or not, or this snow season is going to be more intense or not. And so what we and they always follow some kind of Gaussian distribution. And the idea is that you're probably sh just shifting the energy of the whole distribution pattern so that on average, we're going to have more of the hot extremes and fewer of the cold extremes. But it doesn't mean the cold extremes are going away. And it doesn't mean that we didn't have hot extremes in the past. This is another one of the sort of climate denier arguments like, oh, I just bought a snowball in the Congress because it's really cold. Well, there's no such thing as global warming. Like, yeah, right. Um, I mean, you know, all it does is show something about their relative intelligence, um, not all. So, um, you know, I mean, I, I don't like to sound all gloom and doom, but this really is pretty well understood science. It's pretty well understood conditions. Lots of really smart people have been thinking about this for multiple decades, making models, making predictions, going back every five years and sort of looking at their predictions, and mostly finding that if there's anything to fault, it's that we've been too conservative, right? Like the rate of glacial melting is faster than we predicted because there's a couple things about the way melting uh, water starts to lubricate the base of an ice sheet, which makes it move a little more quickly than we would have predicted. And scientists tend to favor the more conservative predictions over um, the more extreme ones. 
And some of our predictions in these earlier reports, like the 2001, 2007, 2013, are now turning out when we look back retrospectively, it's like, oh, things are happening faster and more intensely than we thought. Um, and so that, that I would say that might be the one, the one criticism. But but we are accelerating in the rate of climate change. We are accelerating the rate of greenhouse gas loading in the atmosphere. And we're starting to see major changes around the planet. I don't know how long it will take for the average you know, country to basically decide. It's not the citizens of the world, I think, understand this. It's the countries that are sort of like, oh, do we want to spend money on this and not be economically competitive with our competitors? And I mean, at this stage, I, I really think we're looking at um, the future of the habitability of the planet in the next 100 to 150 years. And so it really is time for people to take this much more seriously. But I'm not optimistic because I've been following this closely for something like 40 years and things are just not happening as quickly as they could. So if you have the opportunity to do something, do your part. Okay, that's what I got. Questions? Uh, I'm, I'm sure you've heard the proposal to uh, inject a bunch of software into the 